Welcome to this introduction to Conservation by Design 2.0. This introduction was originally recorded as a webinar for TNC's Latin America region in January 2020. This is me. My name is Olivia. I live in Watsonville, California. That's my dog, Leo. And I am on the global science team. Uh, my title is, as Fernanda said, Director of Conservation Learning. I've been at the Nature Conservancy a long time, <laughs> as you're about to see when I show you some of these slides, uh, some of which I took myself. Um, and so I have seen conservation by design evolve and our uh, various global planning approaches over time. <clears throat> and so I, I am here today with that perspective. And I also am, at the moment, the person charged with helping the organization understand and learn about CBD2. Uh, and that may be changing. We may be getting some funding to expand our efforts a little bit. More on that later. So, but for now, I'm your go-to resource for CBD 2.0. Um, the historical perspective. We are coming up on the Conservancy's 70th anniversary, uh, and um, we have had a lot of water under the bridge in that time. I'll be focusing on the last 20 or 25 years on this timeline. Uh, to help you uh, get a sense of where CBD comes from. When I started at the Nature Conservancy back in the 1980s, the late 1980s, um, each country and state program set its own priorities, and each program's success was measured very simply, which was to protect as much land as possible and raise as much money as possible. We called it bucks and acres. Uh, we identified the places that we wanted to protect by determining where rare species of plants and animals were found. And if a species was globally rare, that fact alone would catapult the site where that species was found to the top of the list. Species that were rare within a state, like New York, where I worked then, also elevated a place as a priority in that state, but maybe not as much as a globally rare species. <laughs> and then our, our approach to protection was very simple. We would draw a line around a um, known habitat for a rare species or natural community, and then we would seek some sort of permanent protection for the core area where the species was actually found. This is a place called Scunamunk Mountain in Orange County, New York, where there were rattlesnakes. And you can see there's an, a line on the inside forming a circle with one hatch, that's our primary boundary, and then another line outside that with, a sec with two hatches, and that's our secondary boundary, and that was how we set our uh, goals for protecting the um, timber rattlesnake in New York. And, you know, when we made this map, it was me and our state ecologist. Um, and I don't know, we, you know, we knew where the dens were for those rattlesnakes, but we were more than that just going on our gut about how big that perimeter should be. Um, my experience in New York where this map is from is undoubtedly vastly different from the experiences in Montana or Latin America but I really didn't know how they went about conservation in those places, and there was no guidance or organization-wide standard about how to make those determinations. So that's where we were in 1987. And one consequence of this was um, that because our success was measured state by state, we had the incentive to protect species that were rare in our state with no consideration of how that species might be faring in a neighboring state. So my very vivid recollection that demonstrated why this didn't make sense was that this turtle, a bog turtle, um, had an occurrence in my chapter, the Lower Hudson chapter, but there was a better occurrence. And so where is that on this map? I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right up here in this corner, there was a much better occurrence of bog turtles right over the line in Connecticut. Now, this is New York. So I was up here. Connecticut had a better occurrence. But that didn't matter. It wasn't on me to work with Connecticut on protecting the best occurrence. Um, it was on me to protect, you know, do as many projects in my chapter as I could. Um, there was no incentive, and in fact, there were active deterrents to working across the border in Connecticut or in Pennsylvania, where there were also good bog turtles, or even to support work in any other state. So that's where things were. And as an example of this, if you ever go to our office in Boston, you might see this, which is the window from the door of a man named Dennis Walkoff, who was the legendary and much-loved Eastern Regional Director for many years. Each year, the number of projects that were completed in the Eastern Region were inscribed on this window, and so that's how we measured success. How many land deals did we do? 
Um, this window is now sitting on the floor of our current office in Boston, so you can always stop by and see it <laughs> if you want to see a historical artifact. So sometime in the early 1990s, we as an organization realized that this was a problem uh, and that we were setting priorities inconsistently and that our award system meant that we weren't deploying our resources in the most strategic way. We were also growing our presence in Latin America. And the kind of science that provided the foundation for our work in the U.S. wasn't always available in some of the other countries where we were now working. So our scientists and strategists got together and drew on best practices from across the organization to create a common methodology and a common language resulting in this framework. It was called Conservation by Design because it laid out a very practical, straightforward, adaptive management process for identifying the biodiversity that needed to be conserved, deciding where and how to conserve it, acting on those decisions, and then measuring our effectiveness. Um, at about the same time as this, we began a years-long process of lifting our sights, recognizing the importance of setting conservation priorities at increasingly larger scales. So in the early 1990s, we moved from site and state-based planning to bioreserves, which was essentially landscape scale conservation. I worked on the Neversink Bioreserve, the Neversink River watershed is what made up that bioreserve. Um, this is also when our U.S. programs learned from our Latin America programs about community-based conservation, um, one of the great lessons that uh, Latin America provided to us and to the world, um, leading to John Sawhill's embrace of community-based conservation as a primary focus of our work in 1998. And then by the year 2000, we had started working at the eco-regional scale. This entailed evaluating large geographic areas delineated by climate, geology, and physiography for their characteristic biodiversity patterns and identifying portfolios of conservation priorities. This was a big new concept for us, a portfolio of sites um, for TNC and partner action. So eco-regional plans still focused on biodiversity alone, identifying viable populations of rare species and the best examples of characteristic natural communities. Um, and then, and this was uh, in that slide that I showed you a moment ago of John Sawhill saying we will have um, that many people working at that many sites. This was the natural evolution from that. This was the first time that we were asked uh, as in an explicit way to work across boundaries, across state boundaries, um, and possibly across country boundaries, although to be honest, I don't have examples of ecoregional plants from Latin America. Maybe, Jerry, you could provide me with some so that I know what they looked like and how sort of revolutionary that was in Latin America. I don't know. It's a good question. Um, then in the two, late 2000s, we started working at the whole system scale, uh, which was about uh, working on complete ecological networks that include protected and populated areas. And many of you may be familiar with whole systems uh, because we do still have some whole systems programs ongoing today. Uh, we've continued since then to expand the scale at which our priorities, or at which we set our priorities. So that we're now starting at the global level of you, as you have seen with the shared conservation agenda. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All of this resulted in, conservation by design's evolution resulted in it becoming our uh, organizational identity um, and our common approach. Uh, it was first published in 1996 when we were first learning how to work at the eco-regional level, and it articulated a common purpose and direction that came to define our identity, as I said. Um, and the methodology, and this is important, that it set forth was adopted by partners as well. It has thus unified conservation efforts around the world by providing a common language and a consistent approach across the diversity of systems and cultures and geographies and communities um, in which we and our partners engage. It has always been a practitioner's manual. It has also been used as a management tool as well as a reference to the current scientific and strategic thinking of the organization, which is why it has been updated periodically. This um, bright blue cover down in the right corner is from its 10-year update. Uh, which was done in 2005. Um, and it doesn't just uh, describe our approach, it also aligns our mission and our vision and our values with that approach. And so it's become a touchstone for the organization uh, and, and our calling card, if you will. And it has also 
as I said, it was adopted by partners, and so I can't really describe the impact of conservation by design without describing the uh, effect that it has had around the world. Through the Ephraimson workshops that were led by Greg Lowe uh, that helped uh, refine and popularize our um, planning process, uh, which was you know, conservation action planning, the 5S process, conservation by design. Um, we engaged partners who caught wind of this great set of tools that we had developed and recognized that we had essentially codified common sense um, in a way that others had been struggling to do. And so not that you know we were more brilliant about it, but we, we got to it faster. And so uh, people recognized this was a really useful set of tools. And other organizations uh, started to pick up and start to use it. And uh, at a certain point, we had a number of coaches within the Nature Conservancy who were called Ephraims and coaches because of the gift from a donor that made training them and deploying them possible. But when that gift ran out and we learned that it wasn't just the Nature Conservancy but many others as well who were using this methodology, we got together with uh, these organizations named in this slide, Foundations of Success, Greening Australia, and WWF, and formed the Conservation Coaches Network um, to help uh, train and continue to support and expand the number of people out there in the world who understand this methodology and use it and uh, can make a real difference um, in strategies and in projects on the ground by coaching those strategies and projects using this methodology. So as you can see, um, as of 2019, the stats are we've got um, 14 franchises. Those are geographically based franchises supporting more than 650 coaches from more than 200 organizations in over 60 countries on all continents. Um, and a minority of those coaches actually work for TNC at this point. Uh, and so we have, this is just a little example of some of the trainings that we've held in various countries. Uh, we, CCNet, I'm actually on the board of CCNet, so I do say we in that context. So truly global reach, and in places with really remarkable outcomes, there are countries who, like Mongolia and Micronesia, who have adopted conservation by design, or the open standards, as the Conservation Coaches Network now calls them, as a requirement. You know, a plan must have gone through uh, this level of analysis demonstrate that it followed conservation by design or the open standards in order to be funded or adopted by that government in, say, Mongolia or Micronesia. Um, <clears throat> it has also been adapted uh, in Australia for use in indigenous communities, also in Papua New Guinea, um, and it has been used extensively in Africa to help with the northern rangelands initiatives in Kenya and Tanzania and possibly beyond to bring tribes together to uh, think collectively about what they want to see in their future, what their uh, shared goals are, and then to be thinking through how to get to those shared goals and then to have a plan to steer by as they do so. <clears throat> so it's truly had global reach, <clears throat> pardon me, and, um, and has had an on-ground effect that is Cumulatively, I think something we could consider one of our most successful leverage strategies when you put all of these places together. We also teach it. Uh, there's a woman named Terry Schultz in Colorado, and I'm sure there are other teachers whose names I'm just not as familiar with who have been bringing the open standards, which is the open source version of conservation by design, into classrooms and teaching them at the college level. Uh, I know of several people, including August Ritter and Josh Goldstein and Leander Lacey, if you know him, who took this course at the university in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, and who got their grounding in this methodology there. So conservation by design led to all of this, led to not only the Nature Conservancies having a framework and a unifying methodology that all of us could uh, subscribe to and that could give us consistency in how we do our work across the organization, but it also led to this level of um, influence globally, which is why 
it's an important um, touchstone for us and important for us to keep referring back to it and indeed updating it. Um, so what, uh, w- what we saw happen with the open standards during the, you know, we had the 10-year update for conservation by design in 2005, and then we kind of went down other paths. And uh, we had business planning come into view as the way we were doing our work instead of conservation by design. And various other elements uh, caused us to just leave it as it was for about 10 years. Meanwhile, the open standards evolved and embraced the work that maybe many of you in Latin America are more familiar with than we are in the U.S., having to do with, for instance, putting people into the equation co-equally with nature uh, from the outset of a planning process. Um, and so the open standards, in a sense, advanced beyond what Conservation by Design uh, asked us to do. With the introduction of Conservation by Design 2.0, uh, four years ago now, we maybe leapfrogged the open standards. So we incorporated um, the work that the open standards practitioners had been doing with uh, social science and equity and uh, incorporating people co-equal with nature, and then we took it a couple of steps farther. And uh, and so I'll tell you a bit more about those elements again just in just a minute, but first I just want my lovely little animation. So Conservation by Design 2.0 um, is a bit of a treasure chest, or maybe it's a Pandora's box. Um, from it, there have, or around it, there have emerged various things, the Shared Conservation Agenda. This, the theory of transformational change. We already were working on understanding HET. Conservation by design asks us to think about all of these other things and relies on the hub. And there's been a lot of confusion about where all of these pieces fit. How do they uh, relate to conservation by design? Uh, Which one is the framework and which one is the tool? I posit that conservation by design is the framework on which we can hang all of these other things. All of these other things help us with one or more elements of conservation by design. And the shared conservation agenda is the application of conservation by design to at TNC the what, whereas conservation by design is the how to. This is the thing that got pretty confusing over the last few years. Conservation by design 2.0 came out, and then it was immediately applied and the, the global situation analysis was the result of the application of Conservation by Design 2.0 at the global level as we started to identify what our priorities should be as an organization. And then the shared conservation agenda started to get all of the attention, and Conservation by Design kind of fell into um, on the back seat, on the back burner. It lost the attention of the organization. Um, but a few of us, uh, didn't want to let it completely disappear, and so we've been keeping it alive for the past few years. Um, there's a community of practice that has sprung up around, well, how do you actually use this thing? And uh, I can uh, show you what that community of practice has produced and been doing when I get to the end of the introduction of um, Conservation by Design 2.0. And now, as you may have heard, I mean, David Banks has been saying this, and Uh, Others as well, conservation by design does remain our core conservation methodology and does need more attention uh, to help people um, all over the world who work for the Conservancy understand what it is and what it asks us to do and how to do it. We need to think about uh, what the messaging is for partners and um, how we might want to follow up on that global success that I described to ensure that partners are getting the best of what CBD2 has to offer. All of that needs to be done, and we're now seeing organizational attention paid to that again, which is really terrific. Uh, So what is it about Conservation by Design 2.0 that is so different? These are the four key advances. In the drafting of 2.0, which I will say right now is a really unwieldy document, the guidance document, which you have maybe seen, uh, was translated into this website that that heron represents the landing page of a few years ago. We took the guidance document and put it into website form and then added learning tools where we could to try to help it po- make it possible for people to dig in and figure out how to do this thing. Uh, 
but the guidance remains unwieldy and in some places confusing and it's really variable. In some places it's very detailed about how to do things and in other places it's very uh, superficial. So there is a paragraph, for instance, in the guidance that says, uh, assess enabling conditions and if they don't exist, create them, <laughs> which I find kind of hilarious. Um, because creating enabling conditions is a huge amount of work and a huge field of study. It's about capacity building. And understanding what enabling conditions are, what we mean by them, is a good first step. And none of that is laid out in CBD2. So there's work to be done to tighten it and make it more clear and um, support people in understanding what it needs. And we recognize that. And hopefully that will be part of the next three years' work as well. So... As CBD2 was being written, as the guidance was being written, uh, it became clear that there were four things that CBD2 was asking us to do that perfused the whole of CBD2 and couldn't be just uh, locked into just one part of CBD2. And so they were pulled out and turned into these key advances because it's, you know, this is the ways. These are the ways in which we are being asked to really change how we think about doing our work uh, that permeate all of CBD2. So I'll go into each one of them a little bit. And recognizing that this is just a really introductory slideshow, uh, each one of these topics uh, is something that people have a specialist uh, capability in or not. You know, I, Somebody like me, I can maybe understand what each of the key advances is asking for enough to be dangerous, enough to be able to describe what I think um, it's, it's asking for. But each of these require uh, that we have some people available to us, whether on staff or not, who do have expertise and who you know, study these things or do these things as their primary focus, who can help us understand them better. Um, and then when it comes to the imperative for systems change in particular, we have study opportunities for all TNC staff to help us understand what that means. So let me just spend a few minutes describing these key advances to give you a sense of what they are as soon as my mouse starts working again. There we go. Um, so that you have that foundation. And I'll start by saying the overarching ambition of CBD2 is to help us create systemic change for nature and people, is to um, transform and strengthen the recognition of the relationship between nature and human well-being. Um, so right now, we could say that we, we're all familiar with vicious cycles. We struggle to meet our growing needs for energy, food, water, and other resources. And solutions are usually found at nature's expense, um, as a result of which resources are depleted and habitats are degraded and invaluable species are lost. And then the cycle just continues. Damage, damaged nature exacerbates food, water, and other resource shortages. Um, and then uh, on we go. But we're hoping that if we can apply, especially these key advances, especially those first two, people in nature and systemic change, that we can transform this vicious cycle into a virtuous one where nature and the benefits that it provides is more broadly recognized as part of the solution um, and that it will help serve pressing human needs at a local to global scale. So by going through this process, it is hoped that we can reveal uh, through our examination of systems where and when we have opportunities to change or strengthen uh, the recognition of this relationship and help create or reinforce virtuous cycles through our conservation actions. So the key advances, um, the first two, people in conservation, and then uh, what I'm showing you is screenshots from the website. Uh, and so if you were to go to conservationbydesign.org, and I see that there are lots of chats, and I'm unable to see them. So if there's something that somebody wants to ask me uh, and break in and make me pause for a moment, please do so. I do anticipate being through in about 10 minutes, and hopefully there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, but do interrupt if you want to. So uh, a little bit of detail on each of these key advances. So people in conservation... We have, uh, this slide I think is from Heather Wishick, who has been leading the way in helping us understand equity, inclusion, and diversity, um, and working with indigenous people. So the Voice, Choice, and Action Network has weighed in here as well. We have 
a couple of social scientists on TNC Step that I know of. It could be that there are people on this call who are social scientists. I want to meet you because we don't have enough. And that is a thing that I hear over and over and over again from teams on the ground and at the strategy level is how do you get access to social science? What kind of social science do we need? Look at all the different kinds there are. And when do we need them? Uh, and and so the Nature Conservancy, um, we are like this crab. This is a fiddler crab, right? And we have this um, giant claw <laughs> of understanding when it comes to being able to describe, map, assess biodiversity. And then we have this really underdeveloped claw when it comes to getting human well-being. So our challenge is to resolve the connected human well-being elements of our strategy as rigorously and with as much detail as we do our biodiversity work that we do so well. We want to equalize these two claws and make them the same size and power. And we have work to do on this. And maybe we can learn from Latin America. I do think, I must say, that some of the elements of what I'm talking about are much more true for the United States than they are for any of the other places that we work. Um, in the open standards, in Asia Pacific, where I used to work, uh, in Africa, and in Latin America, uh, human well-being and centering people and equity in our conservation work has been mandatory for a number of years, uh, because that's the only way that you can make a sustainable conservation approach uh, workable and and it's it's you know people and their habitats and their villages and their homes and the resources that they rely on are inseparable from those resources that has not been so much the case in the United States so many of these things that are novel to CBD2 may mostly be novel to uh, United States practitioners and I recognize that and I think a lot of folks in the United States recognize that um, so that's the human well-being, the people in nature part. The second key advance is the imperative for systemic change. And I just want to be sure that it's very clear that this is very different from whole systems. I have had people respond uh, to this idea of systemic change, thinking that it's essentially the same thing as whole systems. So I created this little chart to help us understand. And then there's systems thinking and systemic change. What's the difference between those? We hear about systems thinking a lot. So as this slide says, whole systems, which has been you know, how we organized ourselves at a larger level of work since 2011, it is one kind of system, but it is a geography and an ecological system, an example being the Colorado River whole system. Systems thinking is a way of assessing um, a larger system. Um, and I'm going to get into what does that larger system look like in a minute. But systems thinking is a discipline that helps you understand a system within which you work. Uh, and it is so it's a tool that we can use to understand that system if we then want to move towards an uh, effecting systemic change, uh, creating change at a level that will really move us towards that virtuous cycle that I uh, showed you before. So examples, systems thinking helps us identify climate change as a root cause of drought. Um, and then as we think about uh, what the drivers are uh, and the mental models that underlie uh, those things, we can move towards understanding what levers we can pull to try to effect systemic change. So the United States 50-state climate strategy is trying to effect systemic change, is trying to bring about a shift in how we think about our responsibility towards the climate across all 50 states in the U.S. Um, and, and thereby move the needle on how we think about the, the likelihood and promise of actually working on climate initiatives and doing something positive about it. This is a very common um, image that you will see when we talk about systems thinking. We are um, asked to look beyond the events that we may see happening on a day-to-day -day basis and to look under the water at the less obvious things, uh, including what are the patterns of behavior and trends over time that led to that event. And then beneath that, what are the structures that, um, that help make those patterns of behavior possible? 
how are those parts related and what influences those patterns. And then underneath that, what is it that people hold as their, uh, in their core, as their mental models, as values and assumptions and beliefs that shape the system that leads ultimately to those events? The deeper you can go on this iceberg, the more you can uh, hopefully achieve some degree of leverage um, by working on those mental models or those system structures. And just to illustrate this uh, by going step by step, this is a useful slide. I think I need to move my little image. Here we go. Get you guys out of the way so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so the events. So for instance, the Nature Conservancy's very first acquisition was, or project, was Mayanis River Gorge. It was 143 acres of hemlock forest. Sorry, 2,039 acres of hemlock forest in New York. I should know that. I used to work in the chapter that owned Mayanis River Gorge. And so we bought it. Easy peasy. That was in the day when that seemed like enough. Um, but then when you start moving down on the iceberg and you get to patterns and trends, uh, you see a development of habitats all over the country as a trend. And so we started working at the eco-regional level. Let's anticipate, predict, and plan and, uh, and be thinking, be ahead of the game in, in protecting uh, natural processes as well as habitats to um, anticipate those patterns and trends. And then we started looking more deeply. What are the drivers? Why is this problem happening? So one of the issues was that the legal frameworks and economic incentives worked against conservation. And so we responded by starting to do policy work. And we developed things like tax incentives for conservation easements and many other things, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, to help us work on some of those drivers and create drivers that moved us in a better direction. And now as we start to work at a systems thinking, on a systems thinking foundation, we're asked to be thinking about root causes. So what underpins these laws and incentives, values, beliefs, and culture? Um, and what is it we do about that? Facilitate disruptive change and, and paradigm shifts. One of the ways we've seen that happen is through multi-sector coalitions and, collect, and, and networks for collective impact. And, um, Maybe you've seen this in Latin America as much as or more than we've seen it here. I think working in communities and having ideas uh, spread from community to community is one of those paradigm shifts. We've seen that in Australia. Um, and then in America, in the United States, we've got the Fire Learning Network, which has been a great example of this kind of work where we have uh, – uh, parts of the Fire Learning Network found all across the United States, and the goal of the Fire Learning Network is to change how people perceive prescribed burning and fire generally to make people more amenable to having fire in their community in a controlled way as a way of preventing more devastating wildfires later on. And, and that values shift, that change in beliefs, uh, and that cultural acceptance of fire has been profound and real over the course of the life of the Fire Learning Network the last 15 years. So that's um, an example of what systems thinking can help you uh, do in terms of revisiting and uh, re-examining some of your assumptions and, and maybe the ways in which and the places that we should be working. One of the things that has come out of our, the imperative for systemic change at the Nature Conservancy is this. This is the theory of transformational change uh, developed by a small team, including Lynn Scarlett, Julio Buccoletti, and Kristen Clay. This is a set of questions to help a team be thinking about what kinds of systemic change initiatives you might be working on. Population groups and social movements, something in the marketplace, something in pu public policy. We have a pretty good record in the conservancy of all three of these. Um, this is just a structured way of helping you ask questions to identify what you might be doing um, to augment your systems change uh, work. And we have a webinar or two about this, um, as well as other resources that can help you dive deeper into it. Moving on to the third and fourth key advance, integrating spatial planning with strategy development and selection, and then evidence-based conservation. Um, the idea of integrating spatial planning into strategy development and selection uh, is uh, it's a big deal because in the past we have mapped places but not actions, and this is asking us to map actions and the consequences of those actions, so the quantification of impact. 
Um, this slide was prepared by Kirk Klausmeyer from the California program who went as a COTA fellow to Nairobi and worked on that water fund. Uh, and it helps us see what an ideal outcome of, you know, might look like of this, of what is being asked of us here. Um, so here, for purposes of strategy selection, six different candidate strategies were spatially mapped, and the impacts of those uh, strategies at different levels of investment were modeled and quantified to help the Nairobi Water Fund identify which of these candidate strategies would provide the most leveraged result. Here, Rios is uh, uh, the Resource Investment Optimization System, which was published in uh, 2016, and it was a project of ours in the Natural Capital Project and Flora and Fauna International, I think. Uh, and then SWOT is not a SWOT analysis. It's a soil and water assessment tool, which is a project of Texas A&M University. So that's what we're aiming for. I will say there's still some confusion and uncertainty around uh, to what extent are we asked to do this. Doing this kind of work on an in-depth level could be quite resource and time intensive and not everyone has the resources or time to do that. So this is an area of particular focus for the community of practice and for people who are thinking about what we need to improve in Conservation by Design 2.1, um, or what can we suggest to teams that need to do a CBD2 process quickly and can't do this in this much detail. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, the evidence, key advance. CBD2 emphasizes the generation collection synthesis, sharing and leveraging of emphasis so much that it is called out explicitly in actually three of the five phases as well as in a key advance. So in the phases that are called, um, in the steps that are called identify challenges and goals and map strategies in places and adapt. Uh, there's a specific, you know, this is a good spot to stop and document what you've learned. Um, and the reason for this is because our ability to make robust decisions about investing limited conservation funds requires understanding and bolstering where needed the strength of the evidence underpinning a given theory of change. Um, the evidence base on its own will not sufficiently disseminate new knowledge about how to accomplish these strategies. And what we mean by the evidence base is also an interesting question. Where is that evidence base? Where is it kept? What is it? What qualifies as evidence? One of the things that we are realizing is that our focus, as we, as we move equity into greater focus in our implementation of CBD, is that there's, there's terminology and the guidance about the evidence base. The evidence needs to meet a minimum standard. Um, but traditional knowledge uh, and indigenous knowledge may not um, meet what we call scientific standards for evidence, and yet we really need to learn how to honor that knowledge co-equally with academic knowledge. So we've got some work to do there as well. Um, no matter what you call the evidence base and what you call evidence, uh, it on its own is not going to disseminate new knowledge about how to accomplish our strategies. Unlike in this movie, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they won't necessarily come. So we need to make a commitment to sharing it. And we do that through something called knowledge sharing, which refers to the spectrum of activities like this webinar today, through which information and skills and expertise are exchanged. So evidence can identify what strategies will work or not in a given set of circumstances. But if that evidence is inaccessible or unknown, it just is not going to inform conservation practice broadly. Uh, so practitioners often learn about where to find the best evidence and how to apply it from their peers. In, through this kind of knowledge sharing. Knowledge sharing can take many forms, including communications at professional conferences, at public meetings, online data portals, communities of practice, discussion forums, trainings and guidance, in-person trainings, mentoring, coaching, workshops, on and on. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what I work on, is knowledge sharing. I am not an expert on CBD2, although to date I am considered one because I'm the person who's been paying most attention to it, but we have a growing cadre of uh, practitioners like all of you who are becoming, um, I just noticed that my, <laughs> my words at the bottom of this slide are completely illegible, who are becoming experts and, so, and who are there as resources for their uh, peers. Just a quick glance, this is a terrible slide, but you can maybe see it. There's a tool that has been developed in the Conservancy by people like me who work on knowledge management to help you think about 
where and how you might share what you're learning. And this is an Excel spreadsheet that I'm happy to send to you, but this is just a screenshot of. Um, and yeah, I'll share you. I'll share the real thing if you're interested in that. Um, and I just want to close by saying, as I said, as you've seen from the invitation to this webinar, there is a website, conservationbydesign.org. Uh, there is a community of practice. We have been meeting now for three years. Every other Tuesday, almost all of those Tuesdays with a few breaks, we do have a box folder with recorded webinars that are tagged and sorted uh, to help you find the webinar that is most relevant to what your needs are. There is a listserv I'm happy to add you to. Um, and yeah, and we do have these webinars. And so if there are any practitioners on this call who want to join these webinars on Tuesday at noon ET, um, please let me know. I'm happy to add you.